Thank you, everybody, for coming and finding us here in, in this room for a change. Um, I am really delighted to have um, the Deputy Governor of the Czech National Bank here, Mojmi Kumpel, and um, be, thank you very much for coming here. He has a first degree from the Economics University of Prague, has an MSc then from the University of Surrey here. I was a Chevening scholar. So and you were a Chevening scholar, that was my so next point, it, went yeah. as a Chevening scholar to have an MSc then, then has a PhD from Prague. Um, entered the Czech National Bank in 1998. In 1999, was the Young Economist of the Year at the Czech Economic Society. As external advisor, the finance minister, member of the board of directors and chief executive of the Czech Consolidation Agency, which is the bank restructuring agency and, and state, state enterprise. Run, state run bad state, bank. State run bad bank to, to do this, um, which of itself would be a fascinating discussion. <laughs> yes. Um, and a member of the Academic Council of the, of the Skoda Auto University and Scientific Council of the Faculty of the Evangelska Prushny University, my fluent <laughs> Czech, and Research Associate at Systemic Risk Centre at the LSE. And also since 2017, member of the Board of Directors of the Czech Economic Society, has written 300 articles and studies on economic policies and in fact presented a paper last month Yes, we're still in May, at the BIS and examining the resilience of emerging markets. Um, and represented the Czech National Bank since 2008 in the European Union Economic and Finance Committee, where, where we, we first met, met each other met. when I was doing the EU FSAP. And the, as I was saying, the Czechs were the only ones who thought the IMF was being too integrationist. Everyone else was criticizing us, this sort of semi Anglo report, and saying we should do much more. I mean, the Czechs said absolutely not and also on the FSB's regional group for Europe. So you have a wide range of experience on all these European issues. And particularly, a particular one you're talking on here is essentially, should one join the Euro? Um, the view from, from Prague. And so thank you very much. Um, yes, normally what we do, if you're OK with this, I mean, this is being filmed. And so we podcast it so it's, it's open. And then question and answer is normally Chatham House rule which means that no one can be identified, which helps, you know, frankness. And we've got a smallish group of experts here, so I think we can have a good That's dialogue at that you point. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good afternoon. Uh, many thanks to Charles for this kind invitation and to all of you for coming uh, and listening to me t uh, today. For me, it's really an honor because it's my very first time here at uh, the Oxford uh, University. And let's see if it's not the last time ever after I finish with <laughs> my presentation. Um, uh, I, uh, w when, we, when we started organizing this, uh, we had a couple of uh, issues mm. to, to be discussed and uh, eventually the issue of the Euro and the, the approach of Czech authorities and the Czech debate about the Euro adoption, uh, how, is it, uh, how does it look like? And then I had a dilemma, dilemma, like should it be, should my presentation here be a totally rigorous, perfectly balanced, full of data, uh, etc., uh, and describing perfectly the macro realities and monetary policy realities of our country? Or should it be something a bit more personal, like personal testimony of a, of a person who has been co-responsible for monetary policy in, in my country for now 12 years almost? And uh, I've got a good colleague and friend. He's my advisor. And my advisor advised me to go, on the, go down the second road and to be more personal, like personal testimony. And I tend to agree or accept the advice of my advisor. So. Uh, that's why it will be uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more personal, because the debate about the euro uh, has been with us in our country uh, for the whole period of uh, of time when when I'm with with, with the bank. So ever since the year 2000, 2006. Um, so the Czech Republic, <clears throat> a mid-sized European country of ten and a half million inhabitants. Uh, uh, one, one thing that we share with, with the UK 
uh, sometimes they tend to say that they, we have got also an island mentality. And, and you, Britain, sometimes tend to say that you are you Czechs, you are uh, over there living in, there in the salad bowl surrounded by mountains. Uh, true. So something like that is, uh, is there. Uh, and we entered the, the EU in 2004. Uh, and as you know, or uh, uh, as, as I, I believe that the majority of, uh, uh, of, of professionals everywhere know, we've got no opt-out from, from the Euro adoption, like Denmark or like the, the UK, uh, UK had. So legally, we are obliged to join the Eurozone uh, and something even stronger, to make every effort to be within the Eurozone as soon as possible. This is how the treaty is constructed. Uh, yet, if you look at the political realities in our country, there is basically no single important political power these days pushing the Euro uh, adoption. It is not a part of the real political agenda. And we have got, I can count it, the, the fourth government in a row arguing that the issue of the Euro adoption should be solved by the next government after the next election. So, so it, it became a habit of all the politicians like to push this issue into, uh, I call it the uh, 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 political infinity, like, because after the next elections, what is it? Uh, so this is basically a standard, standardized approach. <clears throat> uh, What's even more interesting is that nobody even considers seriously joining the ERM2 mechanism, uh, exchange rate mechanism 2, uh, which is, uh, I, I think you call it the anti-room for the, for the euro uh, adoption. Uh, so if you ask me now whether there is any realistic prospect of our country joining the eurozone, I would say no, there isn't at, at the current juncture. Uh, interesting is that uh, Germans do attract us to join. <clears throat> Various instances, you, you would be surprised, uh, um, central banker, uh, at the central banking level, uh, officials at, at finance ministries, there are always these questions like, wouldn't you consider starting the process? We would like to have you as a, a monetary stable country to join this group of, of, of stable countries. Uh, and it doesn't change the atmosphere anyhow, it seems to me. So the only two countries I know of currently that are trying to join the, the Eurozone are uh, Bulgaria, uh, this big, uh, big idea of uh, Prime Minister Boyko Borisov mm -hmm. that they will join the ERM2 during the Bulgarian presidency, which I think is not very likely is going to happen. Uh, I can tell you uh, the, uh, many details about this negotiation later on and Romania, and to some extent also Croatia. Mm -hmm. And th the real question is, why is that? Why is that? We are so closely economically integrated with, with Germany. Sometimes they even call us the, the, the seventh in Bundesland, uh, the, the seventh in federal uh, uh, country of, uh, of, of Germany. Uh, uh, in terms of investment, supply chains, production chains, uh, trade, everything, we are very much dependent on Germany. Despite the fact that even uh, w with our own currency, we are still running not a trade deficit, but a trade surplus with Germany. <laughs> Very much surprising for <laughs> outside uh, observers. And this, this trade, uh, trade surplus with Germany has been increasing over time rather than decreasing, despite the fact that we retain our own currency. And now something to, to the atmosphere and, and, and the debate in, in, in my country. 10 years ago, or let's say 12 uh, years ago, supporting the euro was a sign of uh, good social morals, I would say, among uh, better classes in, in our country. So a large part, not prevailing, but I would say a large part of, of the elite and a relatively large part of the population uh, took it as a, as a given thing that it would be good to be in this good club. Uh, Today, wow, uh, only the brave confess to ardently supporting it, like almost nobody. So that's how much the, uh, the mood of the elite and of the electorate has changed over the last decade. 
Um, uh, and here I would start with, with one, one picture documenting, uh, documenting this fact. It wasn't always so, but the population itself was always a bit more skeptical than other CE countries towards the, the Euro adoption. We are the, 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 the red line. Uh, one country is missing there, which, which is Poland, but this would not change the picture uh, substantially. I just wanted to, to, to keep it uh, like visible where we are heading, where is, the, uh, where is the, the atmosphere in our country heading. And you can see that over the course of the years, uh, not only we are, uh, we are at some point the most anti-Euro population in all the countries without, uh, without an opt-out, Sometimes we are even more uh, uh, Eurosceptic than the Swedes. And the Swedes uh, had their own referendum in 2003 when, they, uh, when, when the population said no to, uh, to, to this project. So for me, a, a, a big question, what is behind that? And we, we started uh, studying this because it's not an, an, a, an easy uh, answer to, to, to the question why is that and why is not, uh, has not been changing and the, and the atmosphere is rather stronger, stronger anti, anti euro. And <clears throat> uh, here I've got something like eight plus one arguments. <laughs> explaining why, why, it's, why it's probably that, and I would like to share these uh, with you. So the first one, uh, I believe, which is explicitly or implicitly there, is history. Monetary history on the uh, Czech soil. Uh, <clears throat> this is the former uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and it is after the year, uh, after the annexation of Bosnia, so after the year 1908, uh, when it was the largest probably uh, uh, in terms of the population and, uh, and, and territory. And this, uh, the, 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 this picture is here just to demonstrate <coughs> that Only this part of the former uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy has been keeping the name of the currency ever since the year 1892, when it was established by the former uh, Emperor Franz Josef, uh, Franciscus Josef II, uh, when he uh, conducted a, a really huge uh, monetary reform and abandoned the former uh, uh, guilde and uh, transform it into uh, uh, the krone, the crown, koruna. And it's, it's fascinating for me that we have been uh, retaining, keeping the name of the currency ever since that, despite it is a monarchistic name of the currency. We've got a completely, the Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic has got a completely republican tradition. And the only part of the empire keeping the name of the currency without any interruption whatsoever ever since the 1892 is this part called now the Czech Republic. All the rest has changed the names of the currencies many, sometimes even many times. In our case, neither, uh, neither the Nazis nor the communists changed the name of the currency. <laughs> That's fascinating, like, fascinating. Uh, and there was never a, a tendency even to rename the currency in our own republican tradition. I do not understand that. <laughs> I, I, I try to, actually I try to understand wh why is that. And <clears throat> the only reasonable uh, explanation based on data is that the Czech lands were always very anti-inflationary. This was a very anti-inflationary uh, uh, space uh, in Europe, even in times when it was very complicated to retain this, this mentality of small savers who do not like uh, uh, devaluation of, of their currencies through, through high inflation. Just to demonstrate that. You know this. You know what happened after the First World War. Uh, across the whole Central and Eastern Europe, 
you have got countries with hyperinflation. You have got Hungary, you have got Poland, you have got Austria. Uh, the, the, the inflation of the Weimar Republic was that high, it was 34.2 thousand percent. That is beyond the scale of, of this picture. So, but you, you know that. Uh, and this history of all these four uh, inflations was well uh, described by, by brilliant paper, uh, paper by Thomas Sargent from the year 1982. Brilliant paper, I strongly recommend it to, to, to those who are interested. Uh, so this is, this is the monetarily devastated uh, Central Europe after the First World War. And now, look, this is what happened in the Czechoslovakia. Deflation. Deflation. Uh, when Barry Eichen came, came to Prague, and he didn't know the, the, this paper, I showed it to him, he said, no, no. No, no, you are lying. This is copy. This is propaganda. And I said, no, this is not propaganda. <laughs> this, is, this is the reality of a newly established state, which in Republican tradition tried to give some, uh, uh, let's say, some monetary identity to this newly uh, established, newly born state. There was a, a, a finance minister. The, the name of the finance minister is... <coughs> Rashin, R-A-S-I-N, and he believed that rather than talking about the name of the currency, we should uh, speak about the strength of the currency. And he started this process of pushing the purchasing power of this newly established Czechoslovak uh, koruna, or crown, back to the level of 1914, before, uh, before the First World War started. Well, it was not costless, of course, uh, but somehow the population survived that. And this guy has got right now uh, uh, in every second city in, in, in our country a, a street or a square is named after him. You know? uh, actually, he was the, probably the only one in our modern history who paid the highest price for, for his policy because he was assin assassinated. Uh, uh, but this guy is well remembered in our memory, while these guys are not. Whenever I travel across the Central Eastern Europe and, 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 and visit the Central Banks there in Warsaw or Budapest, nobody remembers these guys. So this was a huge difference, and this huge difference somehow defined the, uh, the, 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 the monetary identity of, of the nation. The nation of small savers, Nation of uh, nation that is behaving, as I say, uh, again and again and again, more German than Germans, because our population is a population of uh, anti-inflationary small savers, even uh, despite the fact that we had no hyperinflation in the modern history, nothing like that. But but the biggest fear, under all circumstances in our uh, population, is inflation. Always. Like, whenever you make a poll, the people say, and your worries, oh, it's just uh, inflation. Uh, quite frustrating for a, a central banker that is targeting a symmetric, uh, uh, symmetric uh, uh, goal in, in CPI, that in our, um, uh, in our environment, it's very hard to convince the, the population that sometimes the deflation, demand-driven deflation is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. and that it can really destroy uh, the economy like a big inflation. But the deflation in our environment is seen like, okay, we will get richer, and <laughs> we will buy more. And uh, So this is a, a typically German-like uh, mm -hmm. mentality. And it, it, should be bear, uh, it, it, it should be taken at, uh, into account when uh, trying to understand what the people really think about the currency and monetary issues. On, on, on our soil. <clears throat> and this is just another, uh, another way of uh, uh, explaining uh, this from, from one, one, one paper from Rudy Dornbusch. Uh, uh, he tried to summarize this in uh, he tried to summarize this in, in, in one picture where it's, it's a lock it's a lock scale. 
uh, where it, it is it is described how the uh, the exchange rate of the Czech or Czechoslovak crown against the uh, against the Swiss franc behave compared to to other currencies, and you can see that it's a uh, it is a logical consequence of of the monetary policy in Central and Eastern Europe. So almost like unbelievable that. Under those conditions, it was sustainable to make the monetary policy that so much different compared to the rest of, of, of the region. And it remained there. It's somewhere there. It's somewhere there in, in, in our heads. And whenever we are, again, whenever we are undershooting as central bankers our, our inflation target, nobody's complaining. Whenever we are just slightly overshooting it, was like it's a furor, like, what are you doing? Like, guys, what are you doing? You are above two. Like, uh, and this explains one, uh, one, one paradox, I, I, I would say, uh, if you are perfectly capable of uh, keeping your monetary stability at home, and this is also the hallmark of our monetary policy after the year uh, 1989, there is not an inherent demand on the side of a population to start searching for other currencies and to to buy the credibility for for the currency from abroad if, if you get it like if it ain't broke why fix it mm -hmm. you know? so this has to be understood when when assessing the uh, the debates in in our country compared to to to, to some other countries uh, i i call it uh, if you, if you allow, I call it the paradox of the Eurozone. The Eurozone paradox is that the best possible members of the club are exactly the countries that are so stable themselves in monetary and economic terms that they don't need to buy the stability from abroad. Uh, and such countries have fewer and fewer reasons actually to, to accept the, the, the single currency. Conversely, the more the country begs to have the Euro, the bigger probably uh, the problem on, uh, on their domestic side, which is, in a sense, the, uh, the reality of, 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 the, uh, of the Eurozone. So canonically, either we can continue to stabilize ourselves, in which case we don't need the Euro, or we will destabilize ourselves, then start begging for the Euro, but in that case we will potentially harm the others in, in, in the club. So here, <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the paradox. Second uh, point, and again, it's more about history and geography and geopolitics. I think that's something you might like. In our case, it's quite complicated to well define a, a geopolitical story for, for the euro compared to other peers, colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe. So. I know it very well after all these years, after all these debates. Uh, the Baltic states took the euro as a geopolitical and security safeguard. As at least a part of it was, was this way of thinking. Geopolitical safeguard. And by the way, they paid a relatively huge, uh, uh, huge cost, uh, especially in bad times, yeah. with, with permanently fixed exchange rate and, and, and currency bonds. Slovenia, my good friends in Slovenia, they wanted to join the Eurozone to cut itself off from, from the Western Balkans. Like, we are not part of, of, of this club. We, we belong to, to another club. And it was absolutely visible, and, and they were uh, quite vocal about that. Uh, Slovakia, our good friends from, from our uh, uh, previous single state, they wanted to seal the reforms of the former uh, Prime Minister Mikuláš Zulinda. Uh, uh, Charles knows that we the, the whole story of reformers uh, yeah. coming after Mr. Mechiar. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they wanted to seal it, and, and the seal of approval was entering the, uh, the Eurozone. Like, yeah. So it, it will be irreversible, in a sense. And from the older uh, countries in, in the Eurozone, Italy, France, Spain, gained the stability of the German mark because they were, in a sense, unable to create such currency at home. And those who were tied to the German mark before the Euro adoption, like the Austrians, the Dutch, they had, they had a, a, a permanent fix to, to the German mark prior to the establishment of, of the Euro. They simply, uh, for them, nothing changed. 
They had no autonomous monetary policy whatsoever, even prior to the uh, to your uh, establishment. So they they have got just another building in Frankfurt doing the monetary policy for them. Uh, not not the Bundesbank anymore, but but the ECB. And for them, it was no no question of asking. Like if if you haven't got anything, you haven't got anything to lose. Quite interesting in this case. This is my uh, third point uh, is the Danish case. Very very interesting from the monetary policy point of view because Danes like the Dutch like the Austrians had a direct and firm peg against the uh, German mark uh, prior to the establishment of, of the ECB and they have got a permanent peg and hard peg against the euro even now so they've got no monetary policy autonomy whatsoever <laughs> so they have got their own coins and banknotes but no monetary policy to accompany it. Uh, and, and they are the only ones who are right now in this exchange rate mechanism too. Quite paradoxical, despite they have got an opt out on your adoption. <laughs> Quite a paradox. While the Swedes, they have got a, a completely autonomous monetary policy with flexible exchange rate, they've got no opt out but they are, they are, they've got no intention whatsoever to, to, to join the Eurozone and no intention whatsoever to, to join the ERN2 mechanism. So these are the Scandinavian paradoxes of, uh, the, the, Euro, uh, uh, of, of, of the Euro adoption and Euro integration. Uh, the, the, third, uh, the third, uh, third argument that um, started to play a role for the elite, and let, let me speak about the elite, the politicians, uh, journalists, uh, all the others. But th this argument really uh, started to play a role more and more, especially after the year 2008. And I'm not, I'm just trying to give you the flavor of what is happening in these, de uh, these debates. The euro and the political union. We never thought about it in, in this way, that the, the Euro, especially in the year 2004, 2005, where uh, shortly after we, we joined the European Union, there was not a debate about where this might lead, what this might mean for uh, political integration. It was simply a, a currency. It has changed completely. This has changed completely. Uh, and, and very strong argument in our debates is now uh, like, <sighs> Isn't the stateless monetary union inherently unstable? Because we've got a federal institution called the central bank, the ECB, but no federation to, uh, to accompany it. Uh, and, and probably there is not so much will whatsoever on the side of, of even Eurozone countries to move, uh, move to a new stage of political integration. Uh, and then people start, uh, start asking the question, how, how the, all these monetary unions were established in the past? And typically, you will, you will see from the textbooks that first you have got a state, and then you impose the currency in the state, rather than vice versa. Here we are uh, magically you know, uh, building the house from the roof down, and somehow are then surprised that it is not that stable as, as you might uh, expect. And this is a new, uh, new phenomenon, a new argument that, uh, that entered the, the debate. Like, do we want more political integration? And if not, then why should we join the, the, the Eurozone in the first place? Uh, then my argument, I'd say my argument, but uh, I'm, I'm skewed because I'm responsible for monetary policy, or co-responsible for monetary policy in, in, in our country. Uh, this is the argument which we tend to repeat in uh, uh, our yearly exercise called the, the, the analysis of alignment. We still tend to believe that autonomous monetary policy is kind of a shock absorber and that it works as a shock absorber uh, if, if properly used. And looking at the political scene, looking at what is happening on, on the side of fiscal policy, very hard to imagine for us economists at home, what are you going to have if you get rid of this shock absorber, this, uh, this adjustment mechanism? If, if you get rid of it, fine, but what will replace it? What will you have instead? 
it seems to me, and the analysis do, 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 do confirm that, that all the other adjustment mechanisms in, on our territory, labor market, fiscal policy, are not getting more and more flexible. Rather, rather the opposite, <laughs> and in many other countries in, in, in Europe as well. And to that, another argument called the convergence trilemma. I, 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 I think that you probably, some of you know the standard monetary policy trilemma, that you can never have the autonomous monetary policy fixes change rate and open capital uh, uh, account and, and, and free capital flows. In our country, when we, in, in the situation of a converging economy, we are catching up with the Western peers, trying to run faster and, and to uh, get to a, a higher uh, standard uh, of living. It translates into a con uh, convergence trilemma. In our case, uh, and the, the case of Baltics and other countries, Bulgaria do confirm that, you can never have these three things uh, at the same time high convergence growth, like growing fast, fixed exchange rate, and low imbalances, be it internal or external. You can never sustainably achieve these three goals at, at the same time. You need, you need some, some absorber. And in our case, the absorber is the exchange rate, which has been constantly appreciating, because we, we decided to grow with low inflation, inflation comparable to inflation of our Western peers, so two or less than two percent, which then means if you are, uh, if you are growing fast, uh, it needs to be translated somehow into nominal variables. In our case, it's being translated into a, a trend appreciation of, uh, of the currency. Fix the exchange rate you, and you get rid of this, this way of, of convergence. Uh, and this this trend appreciation, believe, believe it or not, is very popular among the Czech, Czech public and the Czech population. Uh, um, and just to make it to make it short, I, I will skip one, one argument uh, comparing the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. We can uh, get back to it in in the in the debate. The last argument, very strong in the debate, is uh, macro costs and micro benefits. Everybody understands that in a small open economy of our size, that uh, with, with that many links to, uh, to the Eurozone, uh, there have to be, there must be some micro benefits of accepting a si single currency. Be it on the side, so, uh, side of, uh, of entrepreneurs, companies, hedging, uh, etc., getting rid of all the, the costs associated uh, with, uh, with conversions, etc. This is absolutely clear, and these, uh, these arguments, especially of, uh, of our exporters, are being heard in, in the debate constantly, regardless of the state of, of the Eurozone. Like, we need to get rid of some micro costs by joining the, uh, the, the Euro. By the way, uh, the Czech Republic is one of the least Euro, uh, Euroized economies uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Companies do work with the Euro, but not the, the households. Households get, have got basically no, uh, no FX loans, no FX savings. Nothing like that. They live with their own currency. Maybe one of the reasons for of, of, of that of, of, of the history, you do not need to think about uh, any other currencies to to keep the purchasing power of your of your savings, like in Croatia, like in Serbia, like in uh, uh, in Hungary. So everybody understands this micro benefits, but only later on, especially after the year two thousand and eight, nine, ten. Uh, Observers started realizing that it has got also macro costs, some macro costs that are not visible always in the, in the first place, in the first phase when you are thinking about uh, joining the Eurozone or accepting uh, a new currency, 
but that these costs might be visible only later on. And uh, our debate in our uh, professional papers, but also uh, among professional journalists and economists is, can anybody reasonably calculate these macro costs for the future? And everybody says, well, probably not. So it's very, very hard to weigh these, these two and, and to make any, uh, any ultimate uh, decision about this, especially at the, at the current juncture. Uh, I'm speaking a bit, bit, bit too long, so I will skip all, all, the, other, all the other parts uh, and we'll, we'll end up with, uh, 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 with, with one, one comment. Um, David Marsh, a friend of mine, some of you might, might know him, uh, the, the head of the OMFIF in, uh, in, in London, and for me one of the foremost experts on the anatomy of the establishment of the single currency, on the, on the history of, of the single currency. Uh, he summarized it uh, like this, he said, uh, it seems to me that at least, at least for, uh, for the time being, the Eurozone probably uh, doesn't need that, that many new members, la rather new creditors. <laughs> and this is very hard sell for the Czech political sphere and for, for the Czech public. So that's why I believe we are not getting closer to any point when uh, mm -hmm. the euro will be really a good seller and, and not a killer mm -hmm. of, of potential of potential votes in the, mm -hmm. the public debate, regardless all the potential benefits it might bring. So this, with this, I would I, I, I would I would stop and open the, the debate. Thank you. That was really interesting. I mean, this.